Ah, Geek, Geek Out! Out! Hey, and welcome to another installment of From Geek Out with Love. I'm Sam. I'm Jake. I'm Rich. I'm Garrett. And, you know, this is, uh, even though you guys won't hear this episode until months after the fact, this is the first episode we're, we've, we're recording, you know, after the passing of, of Sir Roger Moore, the, uh, the longest running uh, 007, you know, the longest running actor to, to officially hold that title. And, um, you know, we, uh, we, I think, playfully poke fun at Sir Roger's legacy as, as the world's most famous super spy. But, you know, it's always coming from a, pl- a place of love. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think before we jump into this, you know, this episode, let's, uh, I think we should take the time to kind of talk about it. You know, what does Roger Moore as James Bond, Garrett, I know he means the most for you. So, you, if yeah, you, yeah, if I, you, yeah, if you want to start what does roger moore's bond mean to you both you know in general and to the franchise i mean i don't i don't know if i really want to go into too much detail because i think it's a it's a story for a later podcast but um roger moore was the first james bond i ever saw it was a very a very odd introduction uh you could say but um it, uh, i was watching television at my home when i was about nine or ten years old and happened to catch a scene from moonraker and it just it just stuck with me and so i had you know this i've throughout my entire life have kind of had this scene that's stuck in the back of my head forever um and it took me you know a good 10 years to finally realize that that was the first time that i'd ever seen a, uh, any portion of a bond film um, and you know, the, I really feel like a lot of the Roger Moore films are kind of, if not peak bond, they're like, they're a certain form of apotheosis of the series where like when you're talking, when you think of the classic bond films and people have this idea that they're, you know, crazy over the top with these gadgets and the, you know, crazy locales and all of that, no, No Bond does that stuff better than the Roger Moore films. You know, they are, they are crazy, they are campy and they are glorious for it. Um, And I, a lot of that also, you know, this, um, the kind of smooth, suave, debonair aspect to Bond that carried through, um, carried through into Pierce Brosnan has kind of uh, been dialed back a bit for the Daniel Craig films but um, that really started with Roger Moore. You know, Sean Connery, while a phenomenal actor and a phenomenal Bond, is a lot more... Like, let's just say that when in uh, Casino Royale, when Judy Dench's M says that Bond is a blunt instrument, she's talking about Sean Connery as much as she is Daniel Craig. Um, where, you know, Roger Moore is suave, sophisticated, and, you know... Um, a lot more of the kind of stereotypical secret agent type. Well, I think it was, I know, it's really Roger, and we'll talk a bit about George Lazenby, what he kind of brings to the role, because I think he kind of plays this up as well. I think Roger Moore is is Bond more as a playboy and less as a as a killer. It's almost unsettling whenever Roger Moore's Bond kills somebody, because you're like, oh, he's not like joking and like hitting on random women mm-hmm. you know it's almost like oh that's right he's a he does this for, he kills for a living yeah he was he was the lover sean was the fighter is what he always said but also he he took he took bond like we always talk about like realism with bond like you know with craig especially nowadays you know people look for realism and everything superheroes and super spies included and Mo- roger moore probably took it to the realism from an actor standpoint of being this guy would be ridiculous. You know, this guy would be, you know, he walks in, you know, the story always tells us, you know, bonds, the kind of guy that walks into any bar and the bartender knows what he wants to drink. And he's like, that's the worst spy ever. And he goes, so well then I'm going to take it from this standpoint of, you know, kind of that playboy having fun with it, you know, having a smile while he's doing it. Maybe not a smile. He's killing somebody, but uh, you know, he, his what bonds his Ferrara or yeah he he's smiling when he kills what's his name uh, Locke and for your eyes only that's true but like yeah. he nobody nobody could do 
the one-liners and the quips better than Roger Moore. Case in point, we've talked about it before, so much of Spectre to me is a weird kind of of out-of-place Roger Moore movie, and one of the reasons that movie doesn't work for me, humor-wise or any multiple fronts, is because it's Daniel Craig in a Roger Moore Bond film. And, you know, I think you could take... Uh, Sean Connery and potentially put him in a Dalton-esque movie or Brosnan in, uh, you know, that you could mix and match. Roger Moore is probably one of, if not the only one, that you couldn't put someone else in one of his movies and make it work. Only Roger Moore can make that James Bond movie work. And um, so those moments, like Sam was saying, when he does become that cold-hearted killer... Those moments stick out hardcore, like in Free Eyes Only is I think the one we think about the most because it is the most grounded, I would say, of the, the Roger Moore era. But it's because he, you know, he does play up the humor of it. And I've always said, and I mean this as a compliment to the, the Roger Moore you know, run, if I had like homework in college or I was practicing guitar or doing something where I couldn't focus 100% on what I was doing, I would the one bond I would put on in the background as entertainment was Roger Moore. It was always a Roger Moore movie. I, you know, I'm not going to throw on Doctor No in the background. You know, I'm going to throw on uh, The Spy You Love Me. You know, which is my favorite of the the Moore era. I'm going to throw on Live in the Die or Moonraker or even you know A View to a Kill, because you're always going to stop for that break or that moment or something's going to catch you from those movies and it's going to draw you in for a little bit and you go back to what you're doing. And it was always like this. It was like the comfort bond. You know what I mean? You put it on and you just you it's Nobody had more fun than Roger Moore playing James Bond. Rich, you got anything to, to add about Moore's legacy? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think it's been that I've sugarcoated anything in our previous installments but um, about my feelings towards those movies. But I, I, I kind of, uh, I guess I'm in the same boat as Jake in the sense that there are a lot of great memories that I have of watching those movies and remembering, you know, what I was doing the first time I saw The Man with the Golden Gun, which I think I was probably eight or nine years old at the time. And, um, you know, like everything he he epitomized cool this is, I think, the best way to, is the best way to um, to characterize his bond. You know, he, he, he epitomized what it was to be cool, whereas, you know. Um, Sean probably epitomized what it meant to be, you know, what, what the standard is for James Bond. Um, Dalton probably epitomized what somebody with a little aspect of PTSD and has a little psychosis going through his mind and maybe what somebody in that position in real life would kind of act as. I think that um, Prosnan epitomized the 90s era, suave, debonair, I can wear a tux better and look the part better than anybody um, aspect of James Bond. And I think that Craig, you know, epitomizes the realism Mm -hmm. of everything in the way that we would look for realism in Hollywood. That's one of the great things, just thinking about Bond as a whole, is every actor brings something unique to the character. You know, nobody's really... I mean, Lazenby had the unfortunate honor of having to fill the boots after Connery, you know, where there was that buffer for Dalton or for, sorry, for Moore. Um, yeah. But like, you're right. You know, like the thing I've always liked about the Dalton bond is like, he is like the most anti-establishment bond there ever was. You know, I think in both of his movies, he's like, fuck MI6, you know, like both times. He's like, Kiss my ass. <laughs> and it's just, you know, he's always like, fuck this. But, um, but yeah, more, you know, more was just, it was just so much fun to, to watch his movies and and uh it's you know it's sad because sam and i were talking about you know a couple oscars ago there was that rumor they were going to get all the bonds on stage to get like a photo together and Mm -hmm. uh that would have been just the coolest thing in the world because and it's just sad that you know one of the one of the bonds is gone that's just it's a bummer you know it and like you know we've all talked about growing up watching the movies and there's that weird thing, like when you grow up watching something for so long, you know, 20 plus years, however long it's been, we've all been watching Bond movies. 
knowing that you know and it's kind of like morbid and don't mean it to be sound weird but like watching those movies now knowing he's gone is a different experience you know yeah yeah that's a good point um i just wanted to jump back real quick because when you were talking about how you can mix and match the different bonds and i was thinking about this earlier today knowing that we would be talking about this this evening um i feel like on her majesty's secret service would be if you were to do them kind of like you know obviously with modern technology you know maybe a tighter um plot Mm -hmm. that's probably the perfect script and cinematic adventure that you could put Craig's Bond on. You could probably Craig put would, Craig would be perfect in License to Kill. He would. I I'm still again I'm biased because Dalton's my favorite. I still think the most like just maybe not brutal. Maybe the the movie itself is is more brutal than Bond, but License to Kill is still like just the most brutal. But yeah, I mean you could throw. Craig with his attitude and wrecking ball status like from Casino Royale into License to Kill pretty well. Um, one thing I wanted to say really quick about Roger Moore has nothing to really do with him as Bond. The Saint. The Saint, no, but is, um, is uh, pound for pound like he had the best theme songs of all time, like his Bonds. Yeah, what's, the, what's his worst theme song? Man with the Gold. Though, my, yeah, Man yeah, with the Gold. I mean, he has... Live and let die. Yeah, live and let die. Fucking Paul it's McCartney. Game over. He's got <laughs> nobody does it better, which is my favorite. Yeah. He's got fear eyes only. He's got <laughs> all time high. He's got fucking view to a kill, which is like one of the most famous Bond songs of all time. He does have of, the uh, last Shirley Bassey uh, mm-hmm. Bond theme with Moonraker. Yeah, which is the honestly the only two not great Roger Moore Bond themes are Moonraker and the man with the golden gun but for me there's a huge difference between those two songs though like i would take moonraker over man with the golden yeah, gun yeah like there's a week. there's a chasm there's a chasm <laughs> um between the two of them but um yeah i mean his his theme songs are freaking awesome also gorgeous women yes oh my god he was the lover yes <laughs> he was the lover and the saint <laughs> I, I i'd have to look at it again but they did a um when it was either before Spectre or Skyfall, when those movies were coming out, they were doing a tally of the bonds that um, killed the most people and the bonds that kissed the most people. And obviously, he was in the most movies, but mm-hmm. his numbers dwarfed, I think, like everybody. <laughs> like, yeah. it wasn't even close. Yeah. My favorite kill of his is uh, in The Spy Who Loved Me, where the bald man? fat bald man, he's like, <laughs> Where's so and so? And he's like, pyramids and he like just smacks the tie he's like oh and it dies which they kind of what a helpful chap yeah hmm, he, there's kind of a callback to that in quantum solace where he kills that one he knocks on one agent yeah. and then what's his face kills, then why is he looking at me and they shoot him with a desert eagle three times in the chest yeah That's he works for special brain yeah bond's like then fuck <laughs> yeah yeah so you know Rest rest easy, Sir Roger. Oh yeah, you know, and of course your Shame, work with man. with with UNICEF, which is what got him knighted. Yeah, um, you know, and he always was like, you know, I only had three acting modes, so I prefer <laughs> receiving it for UNICEF. His yeah. three acting modes were, according to him, left eyebrow cocked, right eyebrow cocked, both eyebrows crossed. <laughs> that was that was we Roger Moore's assessment. But honestly, I mean, obviously, we love the more the more films there. Yeah. You know, after I found out the news, I. You know, I, and got home from work. I just popped in for your eyes only. I just had to because that's my favorite. Of, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, only for you. But uh, yeah, so rest easy, sure, Roger, and thank you again. Thank you again for the performances, the films, and the memories. Um, but I guess this uh, this episode we're talking about my favorite Bond film. Period. The end, and it comes out the month of our birthday, Jake. Fantastic. <laughs> The week before. It's like a yes. birthday present to me because yes. this isn't your favorite. No, it's but great. It's a good bomb movie. But it's not my favorite. We're talking about 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the first official Bond film without Sean Connery. Um, and with a Randy Newman theme song or yeah. sound with a Randy Newman sounding theme song. Yeah, yeah it's li- like yeah. a legit one. Well, it's li- Louis Armstrong. Yeah. <laughs> All the time in the world. <laughs> the, the only Randy Newman thing I can think of is he would he would sit at the piano play like two notes and go 
who the fuck is that guy? <laughs> and that's it. Um, <laughs> also, Bond breaking the fourth wall, right? Yes, and this is... Never happened to the other fella. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you guys feel about Bond breaking the fourth wall? Uh, like, is that a point of contention? No, but, I, you know, it's it's almost like, okay, we can all... like. It kind of breaks the, like, tension in the room because everyone's like, oh, man, Connery, <laughs> you know? And George, Laz- you know, George Lazenby, Lazenby is like, you know, he turns to us and he's like, I get fucked. <laughs> 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 this movie's long as shit. <laughs> Longest up until Casino Royale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, I mean, again, it's like we were talking about Superman Returns a while ago with Brandon Routh. It's like he gets thrown into this fucking, you know, iconic thing and, you know, does the best he can. Yeah. Garrett, I remember, if I seem to recall, you were the most critical of uh, of Mr. George. You know, I just don't think he's a particularly great actor. You know, it's, I, I think that this, that uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is like the biggest mistake they made when filming it was casting George Lazenby in the first place. You know, there's so much, there's so much, uh, <laughs> say what? It was a very odd thing to do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's one word for it. I mean, the guy and like the guy is the guy's a phenomenal voice actor. You know, mm-hmm. he uh, he later on in his career would go on to do a lot of voice acting and do really well at it. But just when it came to actually acting in front of a camera, good God, he sucks. Mm-hmm. The only time he sucks for me personally, and I'm biased as we've mm-hmm. probably established, is honestly his introduction, his Bond, James Bond. Is easily the worst yeah. delivery of Bond James, James Bond. Yeah. yeah, that was also real quick. One thing I loved about Roger Moore is he would fucking play that line like a fucking fiddle, man. Like he'd come in and live and let die. You could play on a Magic Secret Service in between him saying the line because he'd be like Bond, and then just like walk for like thirty minutes and then turn around and be like. James Bond, like he he fucking and then you know Dalton would be like Ron James Bond, um, yeah I agree with that. But now I'm curious though because like obviously I know this is your favorite Bond movie. Yes. Does that by default mean George Lazenby is your favorite Bond? Because I've never truly I don't think you've ever truly I've always, said I've always ducked this. You've question. ducked it, but now this is, this is big time, boys. And Moment I got truth. I got two other people with me. And we have, what, 1.5 million listeners regularly, I think, is the number last I like time I checked? The, like I like 1.5 the, mil? Uh, yes. yes. The entire population of Denmark. Yeah, all of Denmark listens to us. We're b- big We're in big in the Nordic countries. Yes. Yeah. We did so, have that one listener in, in Iceland. I don't know if we still do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that part's no bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, no, neither is the 1.5 mil. But <laughs> now, for once, th- th- who is your favorite Bond? I don't know how I've gone this long and never truly known. Is it? George Lazenby. Oh, you know, man. You know, that's 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 a question. That's a It that's, is. <laughs> that's a that's a That's a, that's a question. Um if there wasn't like two more sh- if there wasn't like you only live twice and diamonds are forever, hands down all day every day, it would be Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. Cuz I don't think your favorite movie necessarily has to mean it's your favorite Bond. I mean it it's like you know, saying your favorite song from a band isn't on your favorite album. That, yeah, that's my favorite possible. Beatles song yeah, is "Lucy in the point. Sky with Diamonds." Yeah, my favorite Beatles album is "Hard Day's Night." Yeah. So, who's your favorite Bond? Uh, you know, man. You know, <laughs> you're ducking this question yeah. like Chief Wiggum ducked Millhouse Van Halen's dad in the Radioactive Man episode of The Simpsons. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> You didn't answer my question. You just trailed off there, sir. Yeah, I did trail <laughs> off there, didn't I? Uh, you know, it's probably it's probably Sean Connery. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just definitively say it. It's probably it's Connery. It's Connery. Okay. It's yeah, yeah. I, having said that, the physical like you look at George Lazenby in the in the prologue like fight sequence, uh-huh. he is like throwing his full body weight into those uppercuts and shit. Yeah. Because um, he's never acted, he thinks you actually have to beat people up. Well, that's how he got the role, right? <laughs> yeah. He uh, he broke during his audition. He broke the stunt man's nose that he was like supposed to quote unquote yeah. like stage fight against. Yeah. They're like, he fucked up. Good, hire him. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the franchise. <laughs> they offered him. A, they offered to extend his contract by six more fucking movies. The thing that is the black cloud over this movie for me, and it's not the movie's fault. It's that. 
the way he went about not being James Bond anymore is like dick mode. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he did kind of be a dick before the movie's even out. Yeah, and kind of it, it kind of is like a bit of a jerk off for the whole thing. You know what I mean? You know we're older than he was. Really? Yeah, because he was like 29 when he was making this movie. Oh shit! <laughs> City Miles on that Australian uh, City Miles. Yeah. Can you imagine if Adam West was James Bond in this as originally offered? Uh, that, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if he's just American, he doesn't even try to be British. Yeah. Well, that's why he turned it down. He's like, Bond. Bond. James Bond. <laughs> yeah. The We're Adam going West. after Spectre. <laughs> yeah. Always. Money Penny. <laughs> always sounds like he's on the cusp of orgasm. Yeah. That one. Yeah. <laughs> Burt but, Ward is just with him for no reason. <laughs> yeah, Burt Ward, Bur- Ward is Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, this is, I think this is, okay, why is this my favorite Bond film? I'm glad you asked. The, yes, uh, <laughs> why is it your favorite Bond film? Uh, you know, I think it's very well written. I think it's the most spy-like spy film, There's, though it still has some of those set pieces that we all know and love. It's got the best ski chase. Um, it's crazy to think that Connery, as iconic as he is in the role, never had a ski chase. Roger Moore's got like three, but um, yeah, Roger Moore's got some good shit. And according to Lazenby, he was the one that suggested the Union Jack parachute, but they were like, no. And then they re- oh, they didn't. Yeah, spy, let me Wh- whether how much of that is George Lazenby just being like, I came up with that, and how much of it is truth, I don't actually know. I uh, will never know. Yeah, we'll never never know. But the um, I don't think it was ever disputed, but nobody really gave a shit. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, you know, uh, Diana Rigg, great. Yes. Great. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Telly Savalas is my favorite yeah. Blofeld. And the yep. basis for Bruce Timm's uh, Lex Luthor and Superman, the animated mm. series. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that really makes this a standout Bond film, aside from the points you mentioned, because I agree with you. I don't, you know, I, again, it's not my favorite, but I. Also, I can't imagine Connery, because Lazenby plays Bond as vulnerable, like in the Swiss village. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Connery's never vulnerable. Yeah. Um, this is the this is the Bond movie Connery couldn't be in. He couldn't play this. Yeah, Garrett, I feel like you always disagree with me when I say that. Um, I mean it's it's not entirely wrong because like yeah, Sean, like one of the big things about Sean Connery is that supreme confidence in everything. But um, at the same time, Lazenby's just so bad. <laughs> Well, it's funny you talk about him being such a great voice actor, and so much of his stuff's dubbed in this movie. He's he's what in Batman Beyond? He's King in Batman Beyond. I think he also did he play? Was he in the Superboy? He was Jor El in the Super live action Superboy yeah. series. But he's like dubbed for a good chunk of this movie, right? Yeah, when he's masquerading as Sir Hillary Bray, yeah, and talking about his gold balls, yeah, <laughs> which apparently gets everybody at that dinner party like excited. They're like, he's, his coat of arms has gold balls. I checked my coat of arms while I was rewatching this film. Uh-huh. Zero gold balls. Zero gold balls. Damn it. Just a slight stiffness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, but yeah, the, en- the end of this is, you know, I think what sets it apart from a lot of Bond movies, of course, is... Such a downer. Yeah. yeah. And it's something that's touched on in... Originally, it was supposed to end with the, uh, with the wedding. And you look at that last mm-hmm. shot of them driving off. Yeah. You could roll the credits over that. Mm-hmm. But after Lazenby announced in, you know, post-production or principal photography or whatever, he wasn't coming back. Peter Hunt's like, fine, we'll include what was supposed to be the prologue to Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah. And that's how that all went down. Mm -hmm. I actually think that makes the movie better. Yes. I agree with you. Yeah. I definitely agree with you. Um, It... uh, And it's great because it's... That's not great. It's a a terrible moment in his life. But it... Is something that I always like that it's referenced in Moore's Bond and it's referenced in uh, Dalton's Bond as well. Um, one of my favorite moments, one of my favorite Dalton moments, is in *License to Kill*, where uh, Lighter's wife like throws him the thing and she's like, "Oh, you'll be married next," and he's like, "No." Yeah. And uh, he was married once. Yeah, that was a long time. And ago. that was that's I like that. I always like that little you know that con- there's so little connective tissue between the different bonds that. That's always been one of the reoccurring things that I've always kind of liked. That that's kind of what keeps them all as the same guy, you know. Yeah. Not a separate secret agent. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because my first foray into Bond was Dalton, mm-hmm. and I had no clue what they were talking about <laughs> with that for the better part of about six or seven years. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, but 
you know, so what do you guys what do, what do you guys think? It, you you were mentioning the casting, the script. Well, I mean, I again, I George Lazenby like he's it's, you know, I don't disagree with the fact that he can't act. I don't think he's that great of an actor myself, but you know, he it's kind of like uh he does his best. Um he is physical. I do my favorite Yeah. <laughs> My favorite, uh, my favorite moment in the movie is when he's going through his desk with all the different past relics. But you don't like the opening credits where all the Bond clips show. No, that's fucked up. <laughs> Thank you for reminding <laughs> me of that. That pisses me off because that – if I was Lazenby, I would have been like, fuck this shit because all they're doing is being like, remember Connery? Remember the good times with Connery? But they're doing that with the, the props. The props is one thing, but they're showing you scenes from better movies. That's the problem. Um, for for – you know, mostly better movies. The the, the props. Yeah, the only no, the, what the props does. The props is what connects them to Connery. The opening scenes show you Sean Connery, the or the Connery bonds. This gives him a moment to connect to props of the same character, but played by a different person. That's the first real passing of the torch moment. That's a nice moment. All the little motifs of the different movies, showing the different things is a disservice to I think showing Bond. You know, I think that was a disservice in the opening credits. To, to trying to usher in a new bond because people didn't need to be reminded of that. Um, they knew that um, Sean Connery was better. And uh, I think that's why George Lazenby went insane and grew his hair long with a beard and showed up to the fucking premiere like a hippie. I don't, I don't think that, um, you know, this movie when it came out, I don't want to say it was panned, but it certainly... Um, did not fare as well critically and both commercially as You Only Live Twice and all of the other previous installments. But it seems to be, you know, remembered favorably, you know, or much more favorably as time goes on. Um, certainly from a cinematic standpoint, it did more than maybe any Connery Bond other than from Russia with Love in terms of the way they shot the movie. I mean, hell... The last, the third act of Inception is basically drawn right out of this movie. Which I love. Um, yeah. I think Nolan, yeah, I think, Nolan definitely helped with the revival of this movie in modern audiences' eyes who had never seen it. Agreed. Because everyone's like, Christopher Nolan's the greatest director of all time. His favorite Bond movie is on a Magic Secret Service. That's my favorite Bond movie. And like you know, I will say I thought that before 2010, guys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure, Sam. Fix your hipster glasses and your fedora. Um, but uh, yeah, so he, yeah, Nolan definitely helped. And um, I mean, Lazenby was able to bring kind of a physicality to the role. Uh, that, that I mean, Connery made everything look really easy. Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of the way that he approached the role. I think he's even said that a couple times. Um, Lazenby was very like, I think to your point that you said earlier, when he was throwing a punch, he was putting everything he had into it. I mean, hell, he's like drop kicking people in the ocean in the in the you know the opening scene and um, like crow hopping into smacking some dude with a pat with a big or to a canoe. I mean, he was really throwing everything that he had into um, into the role physically. Uh, and I think this was what, from a from from a technical standpoint, this was the, the first of the bonds that was shot in stereo, or shot with a different type of camera as well. Um, so, like from that standpoint, like I guess they were kind of doing things that hadn't been done before, and. I lost my train of thought, but I mean, this is this is a movie that I always look back on fondly. I mean, I I would rate this probably better than any of Connery's movies, other than Doc, other than From Russia with Love and Goldfinger. After I've now um, rewatched all of them over the last several weeks, um, I would probably rate it ahead of everything that Roger Moore did. Maybe not for your eyes only, but time will tell on that. I don't think it really. Um, sniffs any of Craig's three movies. I'm going to forget what uh, Quantum of Solace. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's it's probably somewhere above Bro- everything Brosnan did but Goldeneye. I mean, it's probably like a top seven Bond movie for me, to tell you the truth. Garrett, 
what do you feel how do you feel that's a about very it? long way of getting there yeah. obviously <laughs> how do you feel about the film and the callbacks i mean i like my my thoughts about this film are summed up in basically six words he had a lot of guts <laughs> I was watching that movie uh, with uh, with friends in Charlotte, and you know, we're casually watching it because I've seen this movie so many fucking times, and they had seen it, you know, at least a couple times too. And but that was the one line where I was like, "Guys, wait for it, wait for it," and that line happens, the greatest death pun of all time. And I was like, "All right, continue. <laughs> we good." But like the like the thing that kills me though is again, like Lazenby just for some reason fails at acting on camera and he delivers like his delivery is not like the kind of delivery you'd get from uh from Roger Moore or even from Sean Connery making a quip like that you know he tells it like a dad joke mm. and it just it just does not work at all um he just i don't know there's cuz you know those the classic bond films all have those moments with the really corny lines but the one guy who just cannot pull it off with any kind of, uh, you know, he, he just, he, he can't stick the landing at all with it. It just, it's, I don't want to say it takes me out of the movie because, you know, I'm never in that movie to begin with. I'm sitting there, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sitting there just waiting for the credits to roll, but, um, that's a long time. It's a long wait. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it, tell me about it. Like, but there's, I, I just, I, I can't get past, you know, there's there's a certain extent to which I can put up with the film up to that point. And then that happens and I'm just like, oh god. <laughs> what about the what about the callbacks to previous films both during the opening titles and uh and in in this, this is the first time we see James Bond's office too. Which yeah, is- I mean, I'm I don't necessarily have a problem with the with the prop callbacks, you know, I think they did the same thing with um uh was it Skyfall or Casino Royale? Um, uh, Skyfall's got the car, the Goldfinger car. Well, yeah, it's it's got the Goldfinger car, and you know, in Skyfall, if you you know, if you look, there's there's callouts to a lot more of the uh, a lot more of the films as well, mm. um, and you know, having that sense of connectedness there between the between the actors is something that you know very few of the films do. I mean, you have um, you have. Blofeld getting dumped in the st- in the chimney stack, but that doesn't even really, you know, that doesn't even really count in the same way. Um, no, I think I think that's fine. But the, you know, putting the, it's so clear that what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a situation where you can watch this film and be like, okay, so it's not Sean Connery, but it's still Bond. I'm okay with that. And then they start in the opening credits by being, hey. It's James Bond, but it's definitely not this dude. Mm-hmm. That's the problem I have with that. It's like, you know, they're already fucking George Lazenby in the opening credits. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think of an analogy. Not, I was like, nah, that wouldn't yeah. work. Do we know if they put that, if they put, I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm assuming Sam does. Do we know if they did those opening credits after he had said, yeah, fuck you guys. I'm not coming back. This is going to be my only Bond movie. Probably, and they, they kind of did that to him as a they did that to him as kind of a fuck you. Uh no, I think it was more of a because there's a couple times, you know, where Money Penny or or Money Penny and M will kind of turn to each other and be like, same old James, and it's just <laughs> <That's> like <laughs> stupid. <laughs> oh, I was referring God. more to just the opening. Well, the no, opening, I, and I, yeah. I think it was more a, a more a method to be like, hey, it's still the same movie series, guys. See. See, we're yeah, cool. like all of that should have gone out the window. Like, whether you it, necessary or not, or you love it or hate it, the fourth wall break should have been the beginning and end of that. You know what I mean? Like I said, I don't have a problem with the props because that gives them a physical connection to the character, but um, they don't need to keep reminding us because, you know, they don't do that in other movies. Like I said, they ha- they have the reference to the wedding, but that's a character thing. Like that's a that's a piece of the character. They're not going. Oh, well, you're just like Roger Moore. You know, it's just uh, <laughs> it's it, they don't need any of that. I will say uh, George Lazenby Bond is like the beginning of Playboy Bond mm-hmm. because I mean, look at this gentleman's wardrobe in this kilt. Film. License yeah. the kilt. License the kilt, and he, you know he's going straight for your heart. Yeah. Um, 
you know, he's got the when he goes to the ra- or the bullfighting ring, which looks like the worst pastime. It's just a bunch of dudes in funny pants screaming at bulls and getting like <laughs> annihilated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he's wearing like the ascot and the knee high boots. And, you know, when he goes to the casino, he's the Austin Powers has the, th- the frills. Yeah, yeah. He gets that from George Lazenby's James Bond. Yeah. Well, um, so this is, I mean, the, the beginning of the movie is just him hanging out in like Monte Carlo, you know, fucking. And, uh, that's, yeah, for me, that's the beginning of James Bond as a, as a more of a playboy. And, um. Uh, It'd be interesting to see what the the film series would have been like without that kind of groundwork laid. Is that his lasting legacy to Bond? Him as a playboy? It's either that or the most him being the most vulnerable of the. Uh, and again, I love I love watching him square off against Telly Savalas. Who loves your baby? Who loves your baby? <laughs> My man, Kojak. <laughs> well, I've always heard the story uh, that he cried in one take. Uh, at the end during the death scene and the director was like you don't fucking cry like he's like bond wouldn't cry yeah well and his thing was like peter hunt the direct and this is the only feature film that peter hunt ever directed too mm. he was a second unit director and uh editor on the previous films and the only reason he came back to do second unit and edit uh you only live twice is under the explicit agreement that he would be allowed to direct the next film um which is why it's so visually striking compared to the rest of the series. Um, it's very much, yeah, it's very much his own film. He ab- apparently carried an annotated copy of the book around with him during filming. But uh, where, where was I? There was, there was a point to... His lasting legacy? His no, I was talking about uh, the crying scene. Like, hey, we said right. don't cry at the end. He, he wouldn't actually he, a tear. He had Lazenby show up to set, like, at ass crack early. Mm-hmm. And just run through that scene a bunch until he was like broken down, like emotionally. By the time they they actually filmed it, mm. interesting. Yeah. I will say, like, as iconic as that scene is, I'm kind of Team Garrett on that, where he's like, he doesn't really sell it to me in that scene. Like, it's it's a it's a if the shock of that scene is what makes that scene for me, you know, like you know it's coming now. You always think like, oh, maybe he'll save the day this time. But it's kind of a uh, kind of a swing and a miss. But yeah, like as the car's wise. riding away, it's almost kind of like he's like, "Oh, rats! It's Blofeld." <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We have all the time in the world. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> the movie does because it's long as shit. <laughs> it doesn't need to be that long. Uh, and you know, it ran a little longer originally. There was a scene where um, a Spectre agent spies on Bond at. Visiting Sir Hillary Bray. It just takes a, it's a Spectre agent taking a shit for 30 minutes, <laughs> just reading the paper. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, Lazenby Bond tracks him down and strangles him to death. <laughs> um, and uh, the other scene that was cut from the uh, final release was when Bond is shopping for wedding rings. Blofeld and uh, Irma Bunt are, are uh, spying on them because apparently that's just... Yeah. yeah. He's, He's getting married. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? What do you guys think of that plot point? Do you think that Diana Rigg sells it? Didn't they hate each other in real life? You know, I always hear that. I always hear that. I always hear that. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I love Diana Rigg. She's a great... No, she's great. She's great. Um, she's great. But do I buy it to the point that this is the one girl he'd marry out of all of them? Like, this is, the, this is it? No. <laughs> but it, uh, it makes for a good plot point you know like that idea of bond getting married and it it all comes back and it works even more now when you watch like casino royale and that moment where like vesper's the one woman that is the reason he has that armor up against any other woman you know um because he was vulnerable once and look what it got him so it 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 uh it works for this movie you know like i said i like that i li- that's one of the connective tissue things i like is that uh it's very, you know, subtly referenced here and there in other movies, and that is one of the lasting things. I think George Lazenby's lasting thing is the fact that he's in the Bond movie, where Bond gets married and she is killed, and that affects him forever. Like that is the thing when I think of George Lazenby and killed. It's George Lazenby's, you know, lasting impact on the series was something that he had no impact exactly. on. Exactly. You know, the scripting. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that he didn't pull off that great performance-wise, but the movie is pretty good. 
<laughs> Is that a question? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this, the the movie pretty much closely follows the book. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't really take too many liberties or go off on too much of a different creative path. And I think that, like, one of the things you see about this story, like, forget the the movie itself, but just the story of Honor Majesty's Secret Service, this kind of births the whole, like, when you're a spy, you're a spy. This is, you know, the, the life that you're going to have. You're never mm-hmm. going to be able to settle down. You're never going to have the long-time love. You're not going to have, you're not going to have a family or any of that stuff. I mean, when you look at all of the, the other, I guess, quintessential type spies and um those that follow like you know your jason Bourne or i didn't really watch 24 but i've heard comparisons of it to jack bauer um i'm probably forgetting a shitload of other ones but they they're 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 always loners it's always them you know god duty honor country all that Mm -hmm. great stuff Mm -hmm. i think this kind of was the the jumping off point for that could argue the failure of this film relatively because again it's the lowest grossing bond film since it's outgrossed by all but two of the, the first two connery films um and it's not well received critically at the time by most circles um you could argue that's what leads to over the top gadget laden diamonds are forever and all the bond films of the 70s and 80s well i think that well, connery was so fat in diamonds are forever <laughs> that he needed all the help he could get yeah well, that and they got an, like their replacement after Connery was an established actor. Yeah, and an older one yeah. too. An older one, yeah. You know, and He's someone two with years older than Connery. Yeah, almost three. Someone with you know charisma and screen presence. You know, again, it's George Lesnby had like no experience in it. You know, it was a huge gamble. He was the the biggest thing he was known for to audiences. Period. Not just audiences in the UK. He was in. Television commercials for big, big fry chocolate. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you can see those commercials where he's just running, walking around London, whistling while carrying a giant chocolate bar. And then they were just apparently he picked up a suit that Sean Connery ordered at Seville Row, Row and never picked up, and bought himself a watch that was you know Bond would wear and had his hair cut like Sean Connery. And that's he shows up to the audition and the director and producers are like, this dude. Yeah, they're like, can he act? He yeah. gives a shit. Look at him. <laughs> yeah. Did, didn't he, like, say that he was in the name, like, in a bunch of movies that didn't even exist in Australia? And Probably. Um, <laughs> but, no, but, like, I thought that's what I saw on the, like, the Becoming Bond. Do you, does, anybody hear, does anybody here have Hulu? Hulu? I do. Has anybody, you haven't seen Becoming Bond. I haven't Bond. watched it yet, though, you know. I want to know. <laughs> You know, uh, the, all my my only experience is that everything or nothing documentary where he actually has a pretty like significant interview where mm-hmm. he basically goes over everything. He actually comes off pretty well in that interview too. That's the mm-hmm. that's the interview that I'm referencing. Oh, does he? Oh, uh, yeah, he probably does mention that he appeared in movies that didn't exist. Mm-hmm. I can see. Yeah, I because it's back Lane. before you could verify half that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just like, yeah, there's totally all these Australian films like. Who knows what the fucking Australian film industry was at the yeah. time in nineteen? Big Spider, Big Snake. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Boy in the Bush. Yeah. I'm the boy. The Kangaroo Here's Kicks my... Back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part two and three. <laughs> We're an island Woo! now, boys. The musical. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> dusty. Australia starring Hugh Jackman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is he in Australia starring Hugh Jackman? No. No. But he is in Gettysburg. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, right. I, I shit you not. George Lazenby in Gettysburg as a Confederate general. Yeah. He does not succeed. <laughs> well, they don't succeed. Uh, in the Battle of the Wall. Yeah. So if you ever want to see George Lazenby with a, quote-unquote, southern accent, that's your chance. You can also see him as Jor-El in the Superboy TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, and did you ever see The Man from Hong Kong? No. It's this Grindhouse 70s Kung Fu. Because originally, fresh off... Um, Bond, he's like basically blacklisted because of his behavior and everything from like Western, the Western movie industry. So he goes east and um, <laughs> he became re- Iron Fist. Yeah, <laughs> probably do a better job. Than oh yeah, fucking Finn Jones. But the uh, that, the <laughs> that comes out the month this episode posts. Defenders. Yeah, 
Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. But the um, he Bruce Lee offers him a job, and it was supposed to be after Game of Death was supposed to be a Bruce Lee George Lazenby team uh, like versus an eventual team up film mm-hmm. like most superhero things. Mm-hmm. But then Bruce Lee dies. Wasn't George Lazenby like? One of the last people to see him alive? Yeah. He had a business yeah. meeting with him or business dinner with him the night he died. Mm. And wow. Bruce Lee realized what was about to happen and saved us all. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Wow. The ultimate <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> I can still oh, yeah, yeah. I can still make finish Game of Death, but no. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. George Lazenby. I love the uh, instrumental theme. Because you guys are mentioning, John Barry. you guys mention all the time in the world by Louis Armstrong. That's not technically the Bond theme. That just nope. plays during the love montage. Mm-hmm. The actual Bond theme is Honor Majesty's Secret Service by dun, John dun, Barry. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, yeah, <laughs> boom, with that yep. bass line. Yeah. Oh, it's the fucking best. The fucking best. Like for me, that's one of the best Bond themes. Of all time. They use it for, like, the Incredibles. <laughs> the, I'll give you the that. trailer. I'll give you that's on you, man. <laughs> yeah. Do you not... Does nobody else here? They play it during uh, the ski chase? Right, right, right. I wouldn't... I mean, me me personally, I would not... Uh, You're more uh, for it, your eyes only? It would not... Sheena Easton. It would not be anywhere near uh, the top of my list. for. It was... Uh, they redid it for the Spectre trailer. Yes. 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 It's. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> fine, but I... Um, you know, I like vocals in my Bond themes. <laughs> so, hey man, it's it's better than Three Blind Mice. It is. Or is it? <laughs> so it is I'm looking nice. at George Lazenby's filmography on IMDb right now. Yes, he was in uh, like a slew of softcore porns in the early '90s. Early '90s. God, yeah. that means he would be. In, that, let's see, if he was born in '39. That means he'd be, like, in his early 50s, which I could see George Lazenby totally doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He was in some movie called, some movie franchise called Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of his Australian films? <laughs> yeah. French. Oh. Well. Oh. <laughs> Maybe <tasteful>. Wee wee. <laughs> see, George Lazenby's wee wee. <laughs> <laughs> wow wow he's in like all seven of them damn <laughs> wait he's the roger moore of that bonds franchise or that poor soft he plays mario franchise. mario the plumber <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so this is my favorite james bond movie <laughs> what, do you guys not like the instrumental theme it's it's fine, but I it, I, mean, I just me personally I wouldn't put it like anywhere near the best on my list. Gents, I mean yeah, it's it's a theme. Okay, Garrett, what's your favorite thing in this flick other than the closing titles? You got me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I knew. He was gonna <laughs> <say>. <laughs> I mean, uh... ski chase. I guess, but I mean, it's you know, it it's just like it. It probably is the ski chase, honestly, because like it's one of the few things that it's one of the few scenes where, you know, there's only there's only so much that somebody can fuck up acting a ski chase, because <laughs> you just kind of stand there and you tuck your arms in and crouch down a little bit and you're good to go, um, but it just ends into that incredibly smarmy terrible pun and i just i just lose it i mean i every everything about this film that I, like i would probably have about 20 favorite scenes if george lazenby were not in this movie but he just infects it i can't i can't deal with it i i, I just really do not like i i yeah I, I can't get over it i'm sorry man i just can't do it well, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Did you ever um, remember that weird, like little the little children singing like the Christmas song in the Swiss Village? Next time you watch this film, if such a time should ever exist, watch it with the subtitles on. 
the lyrics do not match. There's like an incongruity to what's going on on the screen. Like as George Lazenby's like strangling people in like rooms full of random like bells. <laughs> it's yeah. I, you know one of my favorite scenes is is uh the was a ski lift where he is like he gets out of the the ski lift. What is the what is the situation he's in where he's like on the fucking cables? And oh like, yeah, it's very where eagles that's there. That's fucking yeah. awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to him sneaking back inside, and that mm-hmm. leads to the ski chase. Yeah. Because, again, the physicality, you know, Lazenby used to be in, like, the Australian Special Forces. At, l- at least so he claims. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so he, I think he's got the physicality behind it that, you know, a lot of, especially his uh, successors maybe don't bring to the role. Like the Roger Moore, like, hey, this punch is coming face. <laughs> With, um... You, you, Sam, I think you touched on it earlier. You said that Telly Savalas is your favorite Blofeld. Yeah, but, you know, you have to keep in mind, I'm not a big fan of Donald Pleasance as Blofeld. I'm not a big fan of Charles Gray as Blofeld. Oops, I'm oh. all out of Blofelds. So it's got to be Telly Savalas. You forgot the most recent Blofeld. Oops, I'm all out of Blofelds. <laughs> He was only Blofeld for like 11 and a half minutes. Remember how clever it was when his eye gets fucked up and he looks like Blofeld now? He's like, and remember, they just like spray paints James Bond with an arrow. And you're like, this movie's stupid. <laughs> That's right. He has to like be guided through like the MI6 yeah. space. Well, this is where you go. <laughs> I'm your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I do like how they go from Pleasance with a scar to Telly Savalas with the clean face, but I guess they did the whole plastic surgery thing. Yeah, just like the the the, the idea was George Lazen Bond was supposed to have gotten plastic surgery between You Only Live Twice and uh, On a Majesty Secret Service, which is why yeah. Blofeld looks right at him like earlier in the film and it apparently doesn't know it's him until he mi- fucks up his facts about the Augsburg um, Kirsha. And in the book, it was the earlobes? Uh, which Telly Savalas, to his credit, had tucked to look like a blow f- a uh, earlobeless man. <laughs> because apparently that's a, he's, when he's Count de Blowshaw, that's the defining de Blowshaw quality. Because all Blofeld wants in this film is to have all his past crimes pardoned and to be recognized as a count. Yep. Pretty low stakes for old Ernst Stavro. Franz Oberhauser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do you guys enjoy, you know, Kojak as uh, as our yeah. antagonist? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I thought he was great. Again, for me, I'm wondering what the general consensus of people at the time was, because I think so much focus was on Lazenby, true, uh, yeah. as him not being Sean Connery and this not being a Sean Connery Bond that. Savalas doesn't really get his his just due. Yeah. So, anyway. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> also takes place during Christmas. That's always nice. Yeah. Written by Shane Black. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you guys have... Now any... we get to... We, up next, we get to do Jake's favorite, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fucking nightmare movie. I, uh... <laughs> What happens when Bond is bloated and doesn't give a shit? Find out next week. <laughs> I feel like we get a lot of those by the end of it. Yeah. But it's just bo- it's just nonsense. <laughs> song's not well, bad, I though. think the thing that's cool about this series, um, we've gone through, this is the sixth movie in the franchise. Yeah. You, by and large, five of these movies are home runs. Yeah. You know, like, I love... Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I think it's in the top, if not in the top tier, right outside of it. You know, um, I hated, hated, hated um, You Only Live Twice, and, you know, Thunderball is really cool to look at. I, it's kind of boring now, but back then I can see why people would love it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, Garrett, you are not the biggest fan of this movie. I'm not quite sure where you stand on You Only Live Twice. I mean, uh, you only live twice is basically or a worse version of the spy who loved me. Yes. There you go. I will, you know, as a, even having admitted on record that Connery is my favorite. Uh, yeah, I would go that far. Sure. Just swap yeah. out spaceships for, for nuclear subs and that's it. And add throw in Barbara Bach instead of Kasi Suzuki. 
Every, everybody wins, especially Ringo Starr. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my wife. <laughs> That's my wife. That's my wife. We're going to be in Caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Ever see the movie Caveman? No, sir. Oh. I did, yes. <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> that is a hell of a movie. What are your <laughs> thoughts on this one? <laughs> it's It's something. <laughs> Not even hell of a movie. This. What? What, what are your thoughts on? Because you weren't on the Thunderball episode. What was? Do you have any thoughts on Thunderball while we have you on? You know, I, I. It's been so long since I've seen Thunderball that um, because it's just one of those, it's one of those films in the series that like, I never. You know, there's there's Bond films that you're like, oh man, you know, I love this Bond film. I want to watch it. And so then, you know, you sit down and you watch it. And there's bonds where you're, there's bond films where, you know, everybody has their one or two where they're just like, well, I, you know, I, I am aggressively opposed to this bond film. You know, it's, it's the one I don't like. And then there's these films in the middle that are just kind of like there. And when they do that, you know, if there's if there's a marathon on or if I'm like watching through this, if I'm watching through again for whatever reason, yeah, I'll put it in. But um, I don't know. It's just one of those that never really grabbed me, but I don't have anything against it. Well, if you if you uh, if you want to watch it at any point in time, it's all. It's what? We're doing the. Oh, <laughs> you, oh it's you... always on fucking TBS, or sci-fi oh. or some shit. <laughs> you you would cut out for a second movies, there. Five Bond movies in a row. They're always playing Thunderball. It's just Thunderball five times. <laughs> it's a longest <laughs> shit movie too. I think all of them are on Hulu. Oh, that makes sense, especially with the Becoming Bond mm-hmm. stuff. I was like, that's cool. I mean, like, I own them all, but it's so much easier just to stream them. I own Honor Master Secret Service like three times. I own Lice. Lice of the Kill is the one I own the most. Uh, I think Casino would be in them. Three or four times. Yeah. I own Casino a lot, too. Um, I only own that one once. I need yeah. to own that digitally. <laughs> the only Bond films I own digitally are... All the Craig films and uh, Honor Master Secret Service. I don't own any of the Conneries or any of the Moors because, again, I've got the box set. The only reason I got the uh, Craig's, are c- they came with the Blu-ray, sure. and, and uh, Honor Master Secret Service was on sale. And I was like, well, if I'm ever on the road, <laughs> I will have the sweet, dulcet tones of George Lazenby to lull me yeah. to sleep. This never happened to the other guy. <laughs> Line, <laughs> uh, you're not in this scene, George. <laughs> Line, you're, you're skiing, George. There's no dialogue. Yeah. Line, you're it's you're eating lunch, George. This is also the first time we see Bond. Just as a random aside, this is the first time we see Bond eating, because <laughs> Sean Connery would chew with his mouth open. <laughs> what <a> barbarian, <laughs> a Scotsman. Yeah, that would annoy me. Um, so he's got that for him. <laughs> But yeah, so any final thoughts on Honor Master Secret Service before we sign off? Solid Bond movie. My no. favorite. Yeah, Solid Bond. Rock solid. We're, appro- we're approaching the uh, equivalent of my favorite part of it, so, you know, that's... Uh... <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> 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 All right, well, this has been another installment of From Geek Out With Love. I'm Sam. I'm Jake. I'm Rich. I'm Garrett. We'll be back next time with <laughs> Jake's favorite... Bond film of all time. Of all time. My favorite. Just the best. The best one ever. Ever. Yep. Ever and ever. Yep. Goodbye, Bye, James. James Bond. Bond. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.